Welcome to the RAF detachment at Goose Bay, Labrador. 1st of July 1964 to the 10th of July 1965. My name is Lynn Braithwaite and I was assigned here as a Sergeant Airframe Fitter to carry out maintenance on Valiant, Vulcan and Victor aircraft whilst they were operating at the Goose. The aircraft and crews used Goose Bay as an operating base to fly low level sorties. This video is compiled from 8mm film that I shot during my stay. I admit the picture quality is not great, but at least it exists. The opening shots are of the RCAF base, accommodation buildings, headquarters, education centre, library, Canadian Air Force Police and RCMP offices, followed by views over the bay and Otter Creek. trip out with Doug Edmonds from the Royal Bank of Canada and Lenny Williams of Shell Oil on a tour of the base in Happy Valley in the Bank International People Carrier. The first views are of the Royal Canadian Air Force family's housing which if memory serves me right was known as Spruce Park and also a picture of the Royal Bank of Canada building within Spruce Park. We then travelled down to Happy Valley Hardy store and the bank trailer are there for all to see, long before the new bank was built. Then we have general views of the roads and houses, the hospital, Hamilton River, some huskies in their summer coats. Yes, they are there, but they're bad to see, but they are there. The Hudson Bay store, and finally we ended up in driving around the United States Air Force housing area. And then, last of all on this little clip, there's a picture of Doug Edmonds filming the views across the Hamilton River.
local softball teams playing on the pitch near the combine mess hall. Bachelor officers' quarters are in the background, as is the combine mess. And finally, a Labrador sunset. We REF guys used to take the mickey out of the Canadian guys because we used to say it was a girls' game in England. Softball is nearly rounders that our girls play. However, they got their own back in other ways. Now for the real reason that the RAF are here on the goose. In the picture you will see the RCAF, RAF and Air Canada hangar with air traffic control on the top. On the flight line you will see Valiant, Victor and Vulcan aircraft of the RAF Strike Command Nuclear Deterrent Force. And you will also notice that they are in all white or camouflage. And this is to do with the altitude at which they used to operate. The new low level uh, operations are of course requiring camouflage. The first Vulcan is a B Mark 1A. Here we see the crew chief on his long lead standing at the rear of the aircraft checking the flying controls as the crew operate them and he can talk to the crew on, on the intercom while he's there and he can do all the external checks in fact whilst plugged into the nose undercarriage leg socket. There are also Victor and Vulcan aircraft. Now we can see the TCA Vickers Vanguard has just arrived in from Montreal. We then see Vulcan XM598 X Coningsby, now from Cottesmore, departing on a low level sortie of about two and a half hours with a very exuberant takeoff across the top of the USAF base. another Cottesmore Vulcan takes the air. I'll give you some sound this time, not for long though because it gets a bit too noisy. I thought you would enjoy 
enjoy that nostalgic sound. However, now that Vulcan is safely passed, the passengers can walk from the uh, TCA lounge across the hard stand-in to the Vanguard, where they will then depart for Montreal. The second Vulcan then departs very noisily over the pine trees early warning radar site this time in a very exuberant manner but we do try to vary the takeoffs. Here we have a USAF KC-135 getting airborne. Not quite as agile as the Vulcans I'm afraid. This is then followed by an RAF Victor B Mark 1A all white XH-616 possibly from RAF Honington and it's awaiting clearance to take off. We will now see one or two shots of various aircraft. There is a twin engine private aircraft awaiting clearance to fly to Europe. We then see local Royal Canadian Air Force and USAF air traffic. There is also a Royal Canadian Air Force Fairchild Packet Supply aircraft departing, having supplied the goose. We have a Nasty AF DC 4 and yet ever more USAF fighters. Here we have a Royal Canadian Air Force air, air child packet. It's one of their resupply airplanes and was the workhorse for the Canadian Air Force prior to the receipt of the C-130s. So he's been up to the goose with his uh, supplies and now departing south again. shot shows Vulcan arriving in from the UK from RAF Cottesmore. So we watch her do a graceful landing. They are very light on their feet, the Vulcans, with that big wing, and it saves the brakes no end. This is followed by a, a rather nice shot of the Canadian Air Force T-Bird. You will then see a civilian Grumman Avenger awaiting clearance to cross the Atlantic to Europe. As it's a single engine aircraft, it will have to be accompanied by an aircraft of same speed, which is probably not very easy these days. Here we see crew chief Len Rose. Oh, his aircraft is just taking off on a, low on a low level. He came in yesterday on the one that was filmed arriving from the UK. 
we will now wait with others until the time's up and then we'll see it in again. So again, we also serve who stand and wait. We also see Len Rose and the Detachment 1 officer Alec Turner playing around. Here we have some shots of the Hudson Bay commemorative map that I had hanging on the wall in my room in the senior NCO's accommodation. I really like the map and I have no idea where it went to. So these pictures are the only evidence that I have that I ever owned it. The shadows are from the window frames. Well here we are folks, the fall is finally here. Here we see the Royal Canadian Air Force Station Commander's house looking very pretty in its little uh, situation. We also see the education and library building and the hot water plant nestling below the road down on the bottom levels near the tank farm. The birch trees are turning into their autumn colours so you'll just have to bear with me folks while I just indulge um, in a little bit of artistic license. We also have views across the tank farm and Terrington Basin. I will let the pictures speak for themselves. Winter has finally arrived. Here we see some senior NCOs clearing a path to the road from their own accommodation. I then took a trip down to the bank in Spruce Park 
on the Canadian Air Force shuttle bus. I'm now having to learn how to use the camera in manual mode due to all this white glare. Get the shovels folks and all the muscle power this is how you clear car parks the easy way I might have known the Canadians would have it sussed out I'm glad they didn't knock the uh, telephone wires down and as usual there's always somebody comes along who prepared to offer advice Okay guys, no laughing, here's yours truly, on skis for the first time ever, and not a clue. I bought the skis and boots and poles second hand from a shop in Happy Valley for the princely sum of $10 Canadian. The boots were a tad on the tight side, hence I couldn't put any thick socks on, so poor feet got cold, very cold, very, very quickly. I then had to call on the old Canadian boy Dougie Edmonds to give me a clue on how to make them work. Thanks Dougie. Here we are folks, a Sunday morning, absolutely drop dead gorgeous day, no aeroplanes flying and no aircraft on maintenance and no other jobs, housekeeping jobs to do either. So I talked Keith into taking a trip up to Pine Trees in the new Chevy truck and I knew he'd enjoy it so yes away we went. Quite amazing really. Canadians just take for granted and drive around on these glass ice roads without any problems whatsoever. And when you think of the state they get into in the UK when we get a little bit of snow and then it freezes and the whole place comes to a grinding halt. But here, no, it's just taken for granted and everybody gets on with their work just the same. One of the roads we travelled on was quite straight for a long time and I found out later that it used to be one of the aerial roads 
from the good old days way back when the communications aerial was in a straight line laid out on the ground and just mounted on poles to keep it off the actual ground. So there's a little bit of history. Well folks, we've finally made it to the top. In fact, I thought we'd got to the top and we had to go down quite a steep drop and then climb up again. So uh, uh, we had a chance to take some rather illegal shots uh, of the aerial array up on top of the hill. Be all right now because the uh, aerials have all disappeared, I suppose, in 2005. The view from the top is quite stunning. There's the Hamilton River stretching away into the distance, all nicely frozen over. And really, it's the first time I've appreciated how large it is. As the camera pans round to the left, we see the USAF base and the haze over it. Then we see the main runway stretching up towards the basin. And at right angles to it is the other secondary runway and the Canadian base. Here we are on our way back down the hill. Quite an electrifying journey, really. The Chevy truck seemed to have a mind of its own at times. And even on engine braking, it seemed to be wanting to gallop away. But we had an uneventful journey. As we came past the quarry on the uh, left hand side, I got Keith to slow down. I'd spotted the piece of equipment on the way up, but we weren't for stopping on the gradient. But on the way down, we managed to slow down enough for me to have a look. And there's a little bit of history from Lincoln, England. A Rushton Bucyrus stone crusher. I wonder how many years it's been there. Here we have a shot of a Vulcan taxiing out for takeoff. It was an extremely cold morning and the jet exhaust gases condensed in the cold and acted like a great filter which gave the uh, six-pointed red sun which was just shining like a big star. We then see the Vulcan take off. Now we see snow clearing on the airfield Canadian style. What a great sight to see. I don't know how many yards the snow goes off those snow blowers, but it's certainly I wouldn't want to get in the way of them. We also see some a pair of USF USAF Globemasters. And it was at this point I tried out the full zoom on my camera and the sixty four frames per second film speed. Uh, and the resulting slow motion propellers proved that it worked.
Well, here we go again. Another Sunday drive out. This time, we're all going up to Northwest River. And we can only go at this time of the year because the uh, Goose River is now frozen over and thick enough to take the weight of vehicles. In the truck, with the glasses, is Lenny Williams of Shell Oil and Dougie Edmonds is driving. Well, we finally made it to Northwest River, and here we are, all congregated at the high side of the uh, river by the cable car. That's Dave Jones taking films of the guys at the uh, cable car, and I'm up on the hill taking photographs of him, so it all used to get a little silly at times as to who was going to take pictures of who. I just couldn't resist taking some shots from inside the uh, the little cabin as we went across the unfrozen water. It looked decidedly cold and uninviting. Hope the cables hang in there. Once again, I've got to apologise for the quality of the pictures. It was very cold and the good old camera was feeling a bit sluggish if nothing else and the um, and again the operator of the camera wasn't au fait with how much light there was and how it affected the camera and how it you know making it close the aperture down so that you can see the snow but you can't see who's in the picture sorry about that there is a shot of an early skidoo, I suppose nowadays it would be, that's, let's see, 40 years ago it would be uh, a vintage skidoo. And also I was quite surprised to see a little old Ford Anglian nestling in the wood there covered in snow. And it looked to be in remarkably good condition from where we were. This is my uh, plastic model of a Chrysler Slant 6 engine. Uh, I bought the model and built it during cold dark nights. Much better than going to the bar and wasting money on drink. And yes, when the battery is connected, the starter motor, the big black bit there, actually works and turns the engine over and the spark plugs light up and everything. It really was quite um, educational. Here we are again folks, uh, another trip out on a Sunday afternoon in the bank truck. Thank you Royal Bank of Canada. Dougie's driving and Lenny Williams from Shell Oil is sat in the front passenger seat. And here we are off to Happy Valley to see what it's like in winter for the locals. I find that every trip out is an educational experience really good. I'm glad I came to the Goose. Here we have the new bank building in the course of construction, circa 1964-65. I'll be very interested when I visit this year in 2005 to see what it looks like. Or perhaps they've got an even newer building. The um, I took quite a lot of pictures of this actually for my father to look at because he's really into building um, wooden cabins and this one would really open his eyes. And I swear there must have been a whole boatload of nails in it. We also see Pardy's store, this time with snow and some youngster there with his sled being pulled along by two dogs. That must have been great fun.
Hi folks, it's Carnival Week. The RAF don't recognise Carnival Week and our aircraft came and came and went as they normally did. This of course threw back on the Shell Oil people and air traffic and all the other people who support aircraft movements. Having said that, an awful lot of people had an absolute ball all week. And yes, I got it wrong again. I had run some film through for a friend on my camera and it was a different ASA setting. Of course I had reset my camera for his film and when it was finished I reloaded my own film and forgot to set reset the ASA setting. Hence a lot of dark pictures and it was only when I came to change the film at the end of what I'd shot that I realised my error. It was winter sports as well during carnival week and also there was a competition for the snow sculptures. The Corpus Club had a huge castle carved out of a snow bank and it was absolutely gorgeous with a skating rink on the inside. The officers club and bear in mind this is the year that the Canadian forces amalgamated had produced a sculpture of a boat with tank tracks and net wings and jet engines. I suppose it's one way of getting airborne. Be interesting to see how it worked though. The sergeant's mess had had a great pile of snow put in place by the snow blowers between the senior NCO's accommodation and the sergeant's mess and the natives then attacked it with chainsaws, axes, knives and you name it and then a lot of watercolour paint and King Carnival emerged in all his glory with two little oak picks. The Airmen's Club built a huge long dragon, which was quite, well, it was really good to look at. I can't remember who won though. We then had some fun and games on a very cold day. Very, very cold. And in fact it was so cold that the ice and snow looked blue I decided that I'd had enough of the cold wind, so I made my way across the uh, the arena and into the into the curling rink. And I was very lucky to get some pictures. I didn't think they would come out, but I gave it a go, and I was really surprised at the quality of the pictures that came out. Now we're in the um, main arena where we all used to go skating weekends and evenings. We see the ice machine dressed in the ice, ready for a, a nice hockey match. And, and the game that you're about to see is the Sergeant's Mess versus, I think it was the Coles Club, so it would have been a bit of a needle match. Number 14 is the uh, Dougie Edmonds from the Bank of Canada, honorary Sergeant Smith member, um, doing his thing with the ice hockey. And he was good at it too.
a very short clip of the maddest game on ice called Broom Ball. Um, <coughs> frozen brooms, a very bouncy ball, no skates, very little padding, and from what I could see, no rules. This is the time in Carnival Week when the RAF have to take part. Apparently it's tradition that the RAF play against the Canadian ice hockey against the Canadian females. Oh dear. Could well be slaughter. I was the only senior NCO playing in our team, number eight team. Uh, my colleagues wouldn't uh, participate because they said the guys will only get their own back on you on the ice for what went for whatever went wrong during the week. Um, the star of the show really was Sacco in his tutu, who was referee. What a great guy. The RAF were in the maroon kit and the females in yellow. However, as the game progressed, things got very complicated because people kept swapping shirts. But it was a great, great, great fun. Towards the end of the third period, the score was 3-0 in the favour of the RAF. Um, the natives actually were expecting us to get slaughtered. So to keep the peace we decided that we would score three own goals and make the final score 3-3. Three, three. How's that for diplomacy folks? A little piece of history here folks. This is the first British Aircraft Corporation 111 en route to being delivered to Braniff International Airways and it's having a refuelling stopover at Goose. Whilst it was here of course we all had a good look at it because this was the latest um, most up-to-date aircraft that we'd seen for, for ages. So I had a good sneak round and had a look had a look at the interior views uh, and whilst we're at it you know other things were going on so I also got some shots of a Mark 1A Vulcan um, doing crewing checks ready for going airborne the um, had a look at the interior views of the BAC 111 had another problem here with light lighting but got some shots there you know it's a bit visible finally the departure taking off south to the USA and taking off in truly British fashion, straight up. More snow folks, and here we are, some senior NCOs digging their own path out from the accommodation to the main road. And yes, the snowplow filled it in again. I had a good laugh about that. God, the guys were angry. But there you go, that's life. Well, today was something different. And I was glad I was ramp boss really, because um, the guys, all the other guys had all the hard work to do in the cold. We had the Canberra photo reconnaissance, um, I think it was from RF Witten, that 
had an overnight stay on the goose. It was en route back from somewhere out Bermuda way, I think, the Caribbean anyway, down that area, uh, to UK. And it had been doing films for um, mapping purposes. However, overnight, the films had to be unloaded from the bomb bay as the aircraft was staying outside all night and it would have been too cold for the film. And of course the bomb bay is heated when the aircraft's flying, so that's okay then, but to be parked overnight I think would have been too much for the film. This is um, a slightly different method of starting engines to what we normally see on the Goose. You stick a great big brass cartridge in the front of the engine and uh, then when everything's ready the pilot presses the button and the cartridge is electrically detonated and the gas whizzes the engine start around and at the end of it you see the flames coming out the exhausts, the starter exhausts. Sometimes of course they explode which is uh, a bit hairy. Just glad it doesn't happen often. In fact thinking back to my early days in the RAF our Venoms used to start the same way and they did blow up now and again. Anyway we got rid of the aeroplanes on time as planned and everybody was exceedingly happy. Well, the snowploughs are still at work, and the Vulcans still arrive and go, come and go all the time. In fact, in the uh, 12 months we were at Goose, we only lost one sortie, which is pretty good when you think of the amount of snow we've had. Here we see a Vulcan B2 XL36 something, I can't read the last number, being towed out the hangar by Sergeant Keith Buse driving the Tugmaster. All the snow disappeared just at about New Year and then it froze again. What a mess. The, la the ramp was like a huge skating rink and the aircraft that were parked out they were uh, encased in ice all round the wheels so we had to get the Lucas 4 Therm heaters out to free them up before we could get rid of the aeroplanes. Next we have one officer Alec Turner doing exactly what he used to threaten us with all sorts of things if we did kicking at the ice with his Canadian issue over boots naughty naughty and here we have a Victor B2 and the snow on the ramp still gets cleared I think it seems to be a forever and ever job I'll be glad when spring comes Yes, spring is coming. The word is out that the ice is starting to melt. 
on Otter Creek. This means everybody has to get down and get their fishing shacks free off the ice so they can be towed away. And here we see our RAF detachment guys actually doing it. It took them all morning actually because nobody had ever really thought about it. And then of course uh, it became a lot of work to get it free. But all the shacks, the electrics are disconnected and uh, the shacks are towed onto the land into a parking area ready, waiting for the freeze up next year. Our Victor V2 that's been visiting is departing. The crewing checks all went off okay and he's on his way. Got to the end of the runway and uh, had to wait for a USAF Delta Dagger to land. We then see the Victor take off in true Brit fashion. They can't resist putting the nose up, can they? This was followed onto the runway by a Canadian Air Force Beaver with wheels and skis. Here we have the second BAC 111 on a refueling stop en route to Braniff International Airways in the USA. Good old Shell are there with the fuel truck in attendance. I managed to get on board for a few cockpit views and once again had problems with the lighting. The problem is of course you don't know until you get the films back from processing as to how successful you've been. Whilst I was there the Okanagan helicopter came back in from arrived from the USAF side, it had been on a resupply run up to Hopedale. The um, Okanagan have the contract for resupplying the American early warning bases. We then see on the flight line at the far end the Canadian Air Force CF-100s again. They come and go. Never had a chance to go and have a look at them properly though. And finally the BAC-111, all complete and ready to go, departs in true British fashion. Here we see Canadian Air Force C-130 departing, been up on the resupply run. The snow clearing continues and will do until it's all gone. That'll be pleasant. Although I like the snow, it seems to have been hanging around an awful long time this year. Here we have Okanagan again, arriving in off its resupply run. And this Canadian Air Force CF-100s, I think they were called Avro Canada's, are still visiting on the flight line. The snow line is receding north and the snowbirds or snow buntings are with us for a short period. 
I couldn't resist filming them so I threw some bread out to keep them there for a little while and then I rattled the film through at 64 frames a second and the resulting slow motion I'm quite pleased with Sooner or later it's time for us all to go home after our 12 month on the goose and today is farewell to Chief Tech uh, Murray Ferguson at the end of his 12 month tour. Sergeant Rod Cunliffe is also on his way home, he was our supply sergeant and is in high spirits. So we watch them get on the vanguard and long for the day really when we all go home. I was nominated to take over uh, Murray's job as senior in COIC as I was now a chief technician having taken my final exam last year whilst here on the goose and as I was time qualified I was able to get the rank and get the pay so that that was how I got nominated for the job so instead of being on shifts I was on days long days Today we have something different. Exercise Storm Force is with us. This Royal Navy scimitar, operated by a Royal Aircraft Establishment Bedford, is en route to the USA supported by two special cameras with long pointy red noses and a Hastings transport carrying all the ground crew and spares. The aircraft are going to investigate storm formations and the scimitar was to fly through the centre of violent storms and tornadoes etc. It had been fitted with reinforced engine intakes and a nose cone. And here you see yours truly looking at the hot end of the scimitar. The storm force gang then depart. However, on their return, three or four weeks later, we had some drama because as the scimitar landed uh, lost the brakes on the port side and the aircraft veered off the runway and buried itself in the gravel at the side of the runway well gravel and sand and it was sat on its underwing tanks uh, looking very forlorn and uh, we were given very short notice to get the thing towed out or the USAF said they were going to bulldoze it not very gentlemanly considering we'd just been pushing it through their storms for them because they didn't have an airplane strong enough to do it. However, with the aid of some slotted track and the winch on the Tugmaster, we finally dragged it backwards along the tracks it went in and got it back on the runway and towed it back to the thing. A Saturday morning run out. Keith and I went down to Terrington Basin to have a look at the dock never got a chance to see it last year with water so now it's starting to thaw out we thought we'd just go down and have a look see what it's all about we have a boat here I don't know what it is it's a tugboat pilot boat or what it is and I think its name is Prima Vista I can't quite make it out on the film and I certainly can't remember 40 years on this is more like our Saturday mornings Aeroplanes flying, and here we have the Vulcan crews getting some continuation training done whilst in the peace and quiet of Goose Bay. The only problem was the USAF KC-135 decided to join in the fun and slowed things down massively, certainly not as agile as the Vulcan. Here we see a Vulcan doing a two-engine overshoot. Notice the, uh, the dirty exhausts on the one side so he'll be flying up there with full rudder on probably to compensate for lack of two engines the white Vulcan then does an overshoot with four engines going on full song and here we have the ground crew they also serve who stand and wait
Here we have another shot of the Chevy truck, newly washed and waxed by Keith. And here we have the man himself in the striped jacket and Chief Technician David Jones posing on the road above the tank farm and the central heating plant. I don't know what he was smoking in his pipe, but by Jove. In this shot we see the Canadian Air Force officers right at the far end of the ramp from us watching the Canadian Air Force Air Officer Commanding departing in his Cosmo. Here I am looking for a victor that's on the approach inbound from the UK. Finally get to see a little black spot coming up Goose Bay and then finally a big black spot with some smoke coming out the back. He does a touch and go which is then followed by a KC-97 landing and finally the victor comes in to land. I then took some shots of Sacco in his office on top of the hangar and whilst up there filmed the arrival of the victor on the ramp and the servicing crew and crew bus arriving to look after them. The shots you're now seeing are slightly out of context. These were taken in 1969 on the Goose whilst I was a Vulcan crew chief and show the four Vulcans being refuelled en route to Fairchild Air Force Base to in Washington State to take part in the Strategic Air Command bombing competition of that year. The airborne shots show the view through the centre windscreen and firstly the Vulcan's flight refuelling probe then the windscreen wiper and gold film windscreen heating elements are visible. The Vulcans took off from the Goose at five minute intervals but we were all formated for arrival at Fairchild much to the consternation of the air traffic controllers. Here we go now and more shots whilst airborne close up of the next aeroplane at 47,000 feet. The T-shaped handling is the ram air turbine release. Hope we don't need it. Here I am taking uh, a few liberties with a little bit of artistic license. These shots were taken in the winter obviously and it is now July but it was the same aircraft in which some of us departed Goose Bay on the 10th of July 1965. 